Thank you everyone for subscribing to Infinitely Productions. If it is you have not done so, please click the bell and subscribe and we hope you enjoy our content. ...a rat in the eyes of the mob and he certainly helped the federal government in its fight against the mob. Joe Valachi's testimony. He worked for years as a foot soldier in the New York Mafia. Joe Valachi always wanted to be a big shot. He couldn't get it any other way except by crime. Joe might have had a big gun, but he wasn't one. Then he revealed its secrets to the nation. No one violated the oath of silence, Omerta, until Falaci in 1963. He was certainly a rat in the eyes of the mob, and he certainly helped the federal government in its fight against the mob. Joe Valachi's testimony led to the basic destruction of organized crime, the mob. Today, made men, pinky rings, and an oath of secrecy called omerta seem as American as apple pie. Their stories populate respected television shows, bestsellers, and award-winning movies. And it's not just fiction. The exploits of real-life mobsters like John Gotti and Sammy the Bull Gravano are legend. But it wasn't always that way. There is nothing mysterious about the manner in which the Federal Bureau of Investigation works. Its formula is a simple... At one point, J. Edgar Hoover, the top law enforcement agent in the country, didn't even acknowledge that the Mafia existed. A lowly mob soldier from East Harlem changed all that. This here, what I'm telling you, what I'm exposing to you and the press and everybody, this is my doom. Joe Valachi decided to come out of the cold and come into the light and destroy what he had been a party of. And that decision was the most momentous decision in his life, and it was the most momentous decision in the history of the mob. To what? Destroy them. Destroy who? The Cosa leaders, or the bosses, the whole uh, thing that exists. You want to destroy the whole, uh, the whole syndicate, uh, the whole organization. The whole, that's right, yeah. According to Joe Valachi, this decision had its origin in a simple kiss. It's a summer day in 1962. At the federal prison in Atlanta, 57-year-old Joe Valachi has recently begun a 15-year stint for dealing drugs. Incarcerated with him is his godfather, Vito Genovese, head of one of New York's five mafia families. One day, according to Valachi, Genovese pulls him aside for a talk. The subject, loyalty. There were rumors at the time that uh, Joe had uh, become an informant, that he probably was snitching a bit and giving some information, if not about his gangster friends, about others that he knew uh, you know, in the drug business. Valachi developed a reputation, deserved or not, as somebody who could not be fully trusted. Within the organization, he was called Facci Due, which means two-faced. Valachi says that Genevieve speaks allegorically, warning that he needs to remove one bad apple from the barrel before it spoils the rest. Valachi assumes he is the bad apple. At that point, Rito Genovese wanted to embrace Joe, which was the way the mob itself would handle somebody that they were going to kill. Vito Genovese kissed him. The kiss of death. If Valachi wasn't feeling the heat already, the feds made sure he would. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics send two guys to the penitentiary every few weeks, and they call in Joe Valachi for a conversation. Now, Valachi is playing the Omega game to the hilt. No, I'm not saying nothing. Despite learning nothing from Valachi, the agents have left the impression that the mobster had turned. At the end of two hours, they've got absolutely nothing. He leaves. They've got everything. Why? 
prison grapevine. Prisoners began to talk about Joe's chummy relationship with federal agents. It was designed to get Joe Balacci into very serious trouble. That strategy may have worked. As the months dragged on, Balacci became increasingly fearful. He went to the authorities and requested to be put in solitary confinement. He ends up telling them, put me in the hole. Eventually, however, when he refuses to explain why he wants to be in a hole, they let him out and put him back in general population. On June 22, 1962, during a rare walk in the prison yard, a chain-smoking Valachi noticed several inmates following him, sent by Genovese, he thought, to kill him. Valachi picked up a lead pipe. He erupted, beating one of the inmates to death. Then Valachi realized that he'd mistaken a small-time hood with no mob ties for a rival gangster. Valachi has said a couple of times that he was embarrassed that he killed this guy who didn't deserve to be killed. He made a mistake. He didn't feel sorry that he killed the guy, but he was embarrassed that he made a mistake and killed the wrong guy. He was just sorry he didn't kill the right guy. When Valachi learned that he now faced the death penalty for the murder, he had a choice to make. Honor his oath to the family or save his skin. Valachi contacted U.S. Attorney Robert Morgenthau in New York City, using a go-between with mob ties. The U.S. Attorney arranged for Valachi's charges to be reduced to second-degree murder. The same day they sentenced him, the feds moved Valachi to New York's Westchester County Jail. There, the government would assign a veteran FBI agent named James Flynn to Valachi's case. Flynn had spent years compiling an extensive file on the mob. His first attempts to interrogate Valachi didn't go well. I could see that there was a definite hatred on Joe's part against anybody in law enforcement at that point. He would talk, he would not talk. He would recognize the fact that you were in the room and he stopped talking altogether. A week became two months. Flynn made little progress. I had had it up to here. <laughs> listening to him say the same thing over and over and over again. I began to find out after we started having our personal talks that he was a frightened, terrorized man, afraid of everything around him, hated everybody. He didn't have love for anybody. Two words finally changed the tone of the interrogation. I said, Joe, I'm going to tell you one word, and I want you to give me the other. If you don't give it to me, I said, we're finished. I says, Cosa. He says, you Cosa Nostra. You know, all, you know about it. I said, yes, Joe, we know about it. I says, well, what do you want from me? I said, what I want from you is what you can tell me about Cosa Nostra. You belong to it? Yes, I don't. You tell me what you know. And that started it. Flynn had taken a guess. He'd heard wiretaps referring to Cosa Nostra, but he and his fellow agents weren't sure what it meant. A year later, in September 1963, Valachi appeared before the Senate Subcommittee on Investigation, headed by the senior senator from Arkansas, John McClellan. The hearings and Valachi's testimony were televised live. Our first witness today, Joseph Velasche, who is presently in the custody of federal officials serving a sentence for when convictions had in our courts. He seemed to be singularly unimpressed with the fact that it was the Senate. There is a sense in which I don't think he realized the significance of what he was doing. He was just doing it. The mob had existed in its modern form in the United States for more than 30 years. Valachi had been a member for its entire history. Now he was coming forward when the mob's power was flagging. Bosses were being sent to jail, and mobsters with questionable loyalties were able to buy their way in. The mafia was only a remnant of its former glory. 
While alternately sucking lemons and chain smoking, Valachi laid out all the family's business, which he named for the first time. He called it Our Thing. For two weeks, he would tell his story in encyclopedic detail, alternately shocking and mesmerizing the viewing public with their first glimpse of this violent, secret society. He grabbed my hand and he gave me a kiss. This is a suspicious kiss. The kiss of death. 59-year-old Joe Valachi had been a loyal soldier in the Mafia for more than 30 years. But in 1963, under the threat of a death sentence for first-degree murder, he betrayed his oath of silence in the most public way possible in front of a Senate subcommittee on Nashville. Who was the boss of the family that you belong to in Casa Nostra? Vito Genovese. Vito Genovese, Genovese. was the boss. Right. Was he also... His performance was mesmerizing. Until Valachi, the public had never heard an insider's account of the mob. Television now radically changes everything. We got television of a mobster for the first time, 30 years, saying, I'm a member of an organization. It's called Cousin Nostra. It has 20 some odd families, it has five in New York. Here's the boss. It was an incredible intelligence breakthrough, and it was good theater. According to Valachi, he chose to testify for one reason. First of all, I want revenge. That's right. Uh, as the senator put it before, what did I get out of it? What did you get out of it? Nothing but misery. He cracks jokes, laughs at uh, law enforcement, laughs at the mob, even laughs at times at himself. Nothing else. Is it a tragedy? Is it a comedy? It's a tragic comedy. Well, he had the knife and the gun on the table. I repeated some words he told me, but I only could explain what he meant. I could repeat the words, but they were in Sicilian. Like, you repeated, but you didn't understand what they meant. Right. He went on to explain that you lived by the gun and by the knife, and you died by the gun and by the knife. He recites the bloodiest of bloody murders. Uh, he lets us know that he has been a part of a world that is cruel and evil and corrupt and venal and vicious. When you said you'd find him, what did you mean by that? I get him. They can't find him means they can't find him to shoot him. So I, I said I'll find him. Well, what does that mean in your, in your terms? Did you, did that well, mean I, that I, you I, were I, agreeing I, yourself to kill him? Oh, yes, Senator. When you were chosen for this, uh, for this job, did you have any choice? Is this something you had to do when you were asked to do it? Well, uh, you see, now, taught like that never even enters, enters our mind. With the spotlight on him and those senators sitting up there behind that long desk in that red velvet room, in his own mind, he was a hero, but he also saw himself as a traitor. As a 59-year-old grandfather, Joe Valachi was fighting to survive, and the only thing he had to trade was information. Then he... he... He picks your finger. Who? Who? The Godfather. He makes a little blood come out. In other words, that's the express the blood relation. Supposed to be like brothers. Valachi's life had been a struggle since the day he was born, September 22nd, 1904, in the Italian ghetto of East Harlem, New York. His parents, Marie and Dominic Valachi, had arrived from Naples, Italy, enticed by the promise of the American dream. His family's immigration experience was in some ways the first betrayal that Joe lived through. When they stepped off the boat on Ellis Island, they realized that was not the dream. What happened was they were handed a shovel and told, you got a job. Uh, Ten hours a day, they can get you six days a week for five cents an hour. Joe was the second oldest of his parents' six children. He was part of a big family. Lots of brothers and sisters, lots of them died uh, either at childbirth or uh, in the early days after. Uh, uh, mother and father uh, were uh, uneducated. Uh, you know, you could say he was a typical resident of East Harlem in the early 1900s. Typical in that he and his family were desperately poor and at the mercy of violent gangs that controlled street life in East Harlem's Italian community. 
When Joe's father did have work, he was harassed by a forerunner of the Italian mob, the Black Hand. Joe's dad had a push cart, and the Black Hand extorted a buck a week from him for protection. Dominic uh, Valacci paid the dollar a week rather than have his produce stolen, have his cart damaged and broken uh, by, uh, by thugs. Valachi's father failed to meet the challenges of the new world. He drank to excess, then took it out on his wife and children. And his mother always had a black eye. Uh, she was abused every day by the father who was angry at life, angry at his situation, uh, angry at uh, you know, the uh, existence that the whole family was going through here in the American dream. As a child, Joe found escape for a time on the streets. His ability to fashion scooters out of wooden crates earned him a nickname that stuck. Joe Valachi used to use wooden boxes and roller skates to make scooters. Uh, and uh, he got the nickname Joe Cargo. Uh, later on, it just uh, was corrupted and became J Joe Kago. But the violence that was such a regular part of Joe's home life soon became his stock and trade on the streets. Joe was in trouble at a young age when he threw a rock at a teacher. He claims it was only to scare her, but he hit her in the eye and had to go to reform school. Reform schools at the time did little more than reinforce a harsh outlook on the world. In Joe's case, soon after he returned home, he dropped out of school. At age 15, his prospects were dim. He lived in a cold water flat in Harlem. There was no heat in the apartment except what they would have on a kitchen stove, which was fed by coal. Obviously, there wasn't enough money to buy the coal that they needed, so they stole it. Joe, it's believed, had seen the example his father set as a drunk, an abuser, and as someone pushed around by life. He vowed to fight back against his circumstances. He wanted something better. He couldn't get it any other way in those days except by crime. In 1922, as an 18-year-old, Joe Valachi joined up with a gang of East Harlem hoods who called themselves the Minutemen because of their ability to evade the cops at a moment's notice. They had a simple operation. You take a garbage can, you throw it through a window, you go in, you steal everything you can, you get in the car and you drive away. It became one of the things that he could do and he was good, he was a driver. Between 1919 and 1923, the gang burglarized hundreds of New York businesses. Joe later admitted that he preferred nonviolent burglary to other crimes. Well, I think of burglary, you don't get much time, and I never cared to have anything to do with stick-ups. By age 18, Valachi had racked up five arrests. Still, the street-smart thug had never been convicted. But in the spring of 1923, the police finally caught up with Joe. They arrested him during a heist and the charges stuck. He ended up doing a nine month bit at Sing Sing, which he thought was a piece of cake. I mean, he uh, ended up seeing a Broadway play while he was there. Uh, he had a good time, got out and didn't feel any worse for wear after his first stretch. Back on the streets, Joe and some friends tried and failed to break into a Bronx warehouse full of women's furs. A beat cop spotted Valachi and the others before they made it inside. The policeman fired, striking Valachi in the head. His partners in crime fled. They come back maybe an hour later, and Joe's still alive. He's not dead. Nobody's come. So they take him to a hospital. A strong constitution or perhaps just dumb luck had saved him. The ordinary individual would have died right there, but Joe lived in a coma for over two months. He said when he woke up, didn't feel pain or anything else. He did seem to have a guardian angel looking over him. Uh, he did a couple of small bits. He ended up being involved in a lot of criminal activity without too much time in prison. It's been said that it's better to be lucky than good. Valachi had little else to go on. He wasn't book smart or charismatic, but he did have an almost uncanny ability to survive. 
which would serve him well as he was introduced to the cutthroat world of made men. By now, the country was in the throes of the Depression. Soup kitchens were full, employment lines long. Joe Valachi sought opportunities outside the grim streets of East Harlem. He was just looking to make it, looking to get out of the neighborhood, so to speak, or looking to rise to the top of the neighborhood. Joe's own family offered no examples to follow. His father was a drunk and would soon die from alcoholism. His older brother had been institutionalized, and a younger brother had been killed, Valachi would later claim, by the police. But looking around, it wasn't hard for Joe to find role models. The men of respect in his neighborhood were easy to recognize. When the Depression hit, the only guys with real money in this country were the mob guys coming out of Prohibition. Cash, which was better than gold, right? As the Depression deepened, the racketeers looked to consolidate their power. It was a time of change in organized crime, when the modern mob truly came into being. In the late 20s uh, and early 30s was the beginning uh, of what's called the Castellamare's War. And during that period, it ended up with uh, what would now be the Genovese and Gambino crime families uh, in war, at war against the other three crime families. The Mafia War gave ambitious and violent men like Valachi an opportunity. Valachi used a contact from Sing Sing to get an introduction to a member of what would soon be the Lucchese crime family. They gave him the signature test of mob loyalty. Into the mob, you have to prove your mettle by first getting involved in a hit. Uh, and that's what Joe Valachi did. The killing of somebody serves several purposes. But I think the most important uh, one that since there was capital punishment and no statute of limitations, a person who joined the mob and later admitted they did was liable for capital punishment uh, their entire life. The second is that no undercover officer and no informant could join the mob because in order to do so they would have to kill and society wasn't willing to allow that to happen. Valachi's target was a henchman for a rival family. Joe told him that he was going to take him to a game that was uh, right around the corner, where he could be killed by two guys who were waiting to kill him. And that's what ended up giving Joe the entree uh, to the Lucchese crime family. Now that Valachi had proved his loyalty, he was ready to be initiated into a lifelong alliance with his new family. November 1930, 25-year-old Joe Valachi sat in a dark room in upstate New York, surrounded by a veritable who's who of the Mafia. They included Salvatore Maranzano, up-and-coming mobster Vito Genovese, and Lucky Luciano. Over 30 years later, Joe would describe the scene for the nation. Let's demonstrate just what you did. In other ways, now, this piece of paper... This what? piece of paper is burning. This paper is burning. Light it. Yeah? And then, as in your hand, you say... Well, uh, Dan, they give you words in Italian, but I know what it meant. In other words, while you were repeating yeah. the words, you were burning this, the paper. Right. This is the way I burn if I expose this organization. If you think of grown men going through this mumbo-jumbo the same way that college kids join a fraternity... Um, it's sort of hard to look at and say they could do this one day and kill the next day. But in fact, it is all part of this scheme, uh, the thing that makes the mob the mob. So began Valachi's life as a made man. He was in on the ground floor of a new kind of criminal organization. The five families of New York divided up territory, and Valachi began to work as an ordinary mob foot soldier. They hang around the social club. They can get, you know, they get girls. It's not like going in and, and hit a time clock every morning. And you're not in a big bureaucracy where you got to worry too much. You just, if you know your place, you can stay there. Valachi understood his place. He was a soldier in New York's Italian mafia. Violence and murder were the tools of his trade. 
By 1931, Salvatore Maranzano made a power grab and proclaimed himself boss of all bosses. In response, ruthless mob underboss Charlie Lucky Luciano put out a hit on Maranzano. Fortunately for Valachi, he was out with friends and thus removed from the line of fire. By now, Joe was aligned with Salvatore Maranzano. Fearing for his life, he went into hiding. The safe house belonged to the family of Gaetano Reina, a mid-level mobster who had been killed in the Castellamarisi War. While there, Valachi met Reina's daughter Mildred, a 22-year-old dark-haired beauty. Against the wishes of Mildred's family, the two began courting. Joe is a young mobster, and his possible father-in-law had been a ranking mobster. Now he wants to marry the daughter, and the family don't have anything to do with him. When Joe complained about the family's interference to future mob boss Vito Genovese, Genovese was happy to step in and smooth things over. It's Vito Genovese, as I recall, who goes to the family and says, take him, he's a good man. On September 18, 1932, Joe Valachi and Mildred Reina married. Within a year, Mildred gave birth to their first child, a boy named Donald. At first, Valachi was a dedicated father and husband, but soon after Donald's birth, he spent less and less time with his family. Even with a new family and a new connection to his mafia family, Joe wanted more. He was willing to disobey his godfather to get it, and to one day break his oath to save himself. In November 1930, Joe Valachi had become a made member of the Mafia. From the beginning, he worked hard to make money and reap the benefits of being a made man. Life of a soldier can be glamorous at times. Uh, you can make scores. You can, you know, rub elbows with famous people sometimes. Uh, it can be, uh, you know, a heady, a heady time. You can't have the, the big moments. Valachi was a typical low-ranking mobster. He collected money, ran numbers, and took part in several hits. I found him very mainstream, except what he was doing. Valachi had all the problems that... That, uh, that anybody had. You know, he worried about his mortgage, his house in the country. He worried about uh, his kids' education. In time, he grew tired of being at the bottom of the organization. You hang around the social club, they tell you you have to do something, one day you do it. And most of the time, you don't do much. It's an easier life. And a little more money, they didn't make fortunes. None of them were rich. He was doing gophering and occasional hits. And then he had a few, you know, bookmaking stuff, whatever, little rackets. Joe Valachi became what can only be described as uh, a knuckle dragger. The boss would say, this guy is late on the loan, go to his house, and if he doesn't give you the money right away, smack him in the face, throw him out a window, whatever, whatever you got to do. Oh, okay, boss. Well, uh, you know, again, you don't need criminal geniuses to do this kind of work. Your boss, the skipper, uh, takes a piece for you and he sends his money up so you know everything you earn has to go up uh, your wife is looking for money if you got somebody on the side she's looking for money so it's not quite you know um, all that's cracked up to be you know in Goodfellas in time the stress of paying for his lifestyle forced Valachi to break the mob's rules in the winter of 1946 Joe and a mobbed-up partner opened an upscale restaurant called The Lido in the Castle Hill section of the Bronx. But within months, Valachi realized that his partner was stealing. Valachi, who didn't deal well with betrayal, took matters into his own hands. He beat his partner to a pulp. By doing so, Valachi broke a cardinal rule of the mob. They called it the no-hands rule. You could beat the hell out of an associate, but if it's a made man, uh-uh, no, no. And again, there was a very practical reason for that. Without that rule, you'd have people at, the, at each other's throats all the time and it would be organizationally a mess. So the idea was, if you had a beef with somebody, you went to the bosses. Joe was lucky. 
mafia bosses agreed that his partner probably deserved a beating. This was one of several events that convinced the bosses that Valachi was a loose cannon. Perhaps this is why, after almost two decades as a made man, Valachi was still performing the menial tasks of a low-ranking soldier. When they really needed a big hit, you couldn't go to Joe Valachi. Nobody would go to him for that. First of all, to get a great assassin, you have to be inside. If you want to hit a mob guy, say, and that happened quite a bit, then you had to have somebody you trusted. Valachi dabbled in every scam he could think of, but it didn't seem to matter. He was in jukeboxes. He was in the numbers racket. He would do anything that he could to earn a buck. It's just that, in large measure, he was not a successful earner. The mob did help Valachi out with one expensive leisure activity. He was an avid horse race fan and handicapper. By the 40s, he had gotten enough money together to purchase his own horse. They're not running in the Kentucky Derby. They weren't thoroughbreds. I think they were trotters. He wasn't big enough to get in there like and go do it by himself. And he'd been there forever. So they want to take care of these guys. Part of it is to make sure they don't become informers. But by the mid-1950s, Joe had branched out into the riskiest business that the mob undertook, drugs. Years earlier, mob boss Frank Costello made an official proclamation. Drug dealing was off limits. What Costello wanted to do was to withdraw from illicit behaviors that posed a risk to him. Because the penalty for narcotics is so high, the risk of somebody turning on the boss is high. That never really stuck. Valachi did not pass up an opportunity to grab some of that money. His involvement in narcotics was established so that he could make enough money to go back into Shylocking, um, running the, the numbers. But Vito Genovese, Valachi's godfather, muscled in on his first drug deal, taking much of the profit. He then threatened Valachi. Genovese said, don't do it anymore. But Joe went right out and did it again anyhow. Valachi sold narcotics secretly and ended up in exactly the kind of trouble the mafia feared. In 1956, he was convicted for trafficking heroin. It was the first time Valachi had spent time behind bars since his 1920s stint at Sing Sing. Valachi got out in time to hear about a fiasco that would embarrass the mob for decades to come and would give him one more motivation to turn. In the fall of 1957, mob families gathered for a summit in upstate New York. Gangster Joe Valachi wasn't there. He was just a soldier, not someone who would be consulted on important issues. On the agenda, narcotics and Vito Genovese's unsanctioned hit on mob boss Albert Anastasia. What was on the agenda? One was, why did Genovese kill Albert Anastasia? One boss kills another boss without permission. He had to explain that. Another issue on the agenda was narcotics. The rural Appalachian retreat had been picked because of its secluded location. But when a vigilant local state trooper noticed limos and mobsters with silk suits invading his town, he set up roadblocks. Many of the mafiosi fled into the woods. There were men in Brooks Brothers suits running through the woods near Appalachia to get away from that house that day. I mean, they were not running from anything except exposure. Joe Valachi heard about the spectacle and was disgusted. Mob guys in sharkskin suits running through the woods like, like scared rabbits. Big, powerful guys. Boy, uh, boy, you really stood up to the cops. So what kind of example is that? I guess Valachi's point was, these guys are acting like idiots. We're not supposed to be looking up to them. Uh, and it's one of the things that he used to justify him not wanting to be a boss. Law enforcement reports from the Appalachian meeting forced the government to finally acknowledge the Mafia's existence. In the coming years, the Justice Department would make toppling the mob a priority. When the Fed started looking at the post-1957 
mob using mandatory minimums and undercover operations, they began to get convictions. Within two years of Appalachian, boss Vito Genovese was convicted of dealing narcotics and sentenced to 15 years in prison. Then, in 1959, Vellacci notched his second conviction for trafficking heroin from Italy. He skipped town rather than serve his sentence. Hoping for leniency, Joe decided to turn himself in to the feds after months on the land. He knew this time around he faced a long prison sentence. Joe didn't have a chance. So all he wanted to do was to stay alive, but he wanted revenge, and revenge is what motivated him. And revenge is what I took advantage of. In prison, Vellacci feared he was a marked man, so much so that he beat to death an inmate he mistakenly thought was out to kill him. At this point, Vellacci fell into the hands of the FBI and the McClellan Committee. During this 14 months period of undeclared war and what you term declared war. Do you know how many people were killed altogether during that time on either side or both sides? Senator, I got the score. The score was we lost one and they lost from 40 to 60. Vellacci described the ritualistic nature of the mob. Everybody gets up and shake hands. They say a few more words together, which I can recall. They also said in Sicilian. Well, did you know what they meant? Well, uh, I, I, actually, I never asked what it meant. But it meant, like, a, a sort of in the style of an organization or, you know, in that style. But I never, you don't bother. I didn't bother. I never did bother. You never did what? I never bothered to find out what it meant, but yeah. I have an idea what it well, meant. Well, you had an idea. What was your idea? All tied up. Oh, we're all tied up. We're all life. together. All together. We're all together. Right. right. We sink together, hang together, live together. Yes. He spoke with an encyclopedic knowledge that some found hard to believe. He was a low-level member in one large family. How is he identifying people in these other families? He can tell his own history. How does he get this comprehensive knowledge? Some thought the government fed Vellacci as much information as they received from him. At least in Chicago, they give you $200 a week. Over here, they want you to stop. That's the attitude the soldiers in New York took at that time. He was coached, and he became an expert on organized crime in Detroit, Cleveland, Chicago, Las Vegas, and so on, things he didn't know anything about. But it was clear Vellacci hadn't been coached on everything. He was asked by the senator from Nebraska, tell me, Mr. Vellacci, about crime conditions in uh, Omaha. And uh, Vellacci was stumped. He said, where's Omaha? Well, he certainly had his recollection refreshed. And it really makes very little difference. Because the truth was that Vellacci didn't testify in criminal proceedings. They were not being used to convict people of crimes. They were being used to explain the existence of an organization, what it did, and how it operated. And that clearly was true. Now, even if I talk, I should never talk about this. And I'm doing so. That's my best way to explain. That is the highest oath you took. Right. In other words, that was the most sacred in, in this organization. Right. I want that you. you would never tell this. Right. Right. But the oath of Omerta had become little more than words to the former mob soldier. Before, what did I get out of it? What'd you get out of it? Nothing but misery. In October 1963, after Joe Vellacci testified before the McClellan Senate Subcommittee on Investigations, the Justice Department wasn't quite done with him. They housed him in the District of Columbia jail, where he enjoyed a few comforts, like being able to cook Italian specialties on a hot plate. He talked about his experiences in the mob, but left much of his personal life to the Fed's imaginations. He loved to cook himself by what he told us about how he would cook for his girlfriends. He never named them, surprisingly enough. He never gave the name of any woman that he was ever involved with that could be identified. 
In November 1963, just one day after President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, the Saturday Evening Post published an article written by journalist Peter Moss entitled Joe Valachi, the killer who told on the mob. Peter Moss had poured over film of the McClellan hearings for the article. Three years later, he met Valachi. The feds had handpicked him to write Valachi's memoirs, a job that was not without its challenges. A segment of the Italian community appealed to the Justice Department to halt the book's publication. I had been voted public enemy number one by the Sons of Italy, uh, the, uh, that I was uh, slurring all Americans of Italian ancestry. After two years of legal wrangling, the Valachi Papers was published in the winter of 1968. Valachi had finally received the revenge he'd been seeking. But he was about to endure a final disappointment. The U.S. government had promised Valachi that they would relocate him to an island near Guam. Instead, he was shipped off to prison. Joe Valachi could look at a life and realize, I've lost it all. I have absolutely nothing. I lost my wife. I lost my children. I earned a few dollars here and a few dollars there. It's all gone. It's all been for nothing. Seven years after Valachi's testimony, his defection from the mob paved the way for the passage of new laws designed to prevent witness tampering, racketeering, and many of the other illicit mob activities. I know that that testimony materially led in 1970 to the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organization statute. We could not get the wiretap statute, which was a major change in the way we gathered evidence. But Valachi, McClellan Committee made that possible. On April 3, 1971, at Latuna Federal Corrections Institute in El Paso, Texas, Joseph Michael Valachi died of a heart attack at the age of 67. There was no funeral. The former mafia soldier from East Harlem had long since been estranged from his wife and son. The only acknowledgement of his death came from a mysterious woman named Marie Jackson, who claimed Valachi's remains. In 1972, the Valachi Papers, a movie based on Moss's book, premiered. It starred Charles Bronson and had a successful but brief run at theaters. It's not a very good movie, and if you're Joe Valachi, you, you would not be very <laughs> impressed by it. <laughs> But another movie released that year would come to define the mafia genre. The Godfather, based on the book by Mario Puzo, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, broke box office records. The Godfather couldn't have happened without Valachi. I mean it. All of that stuff, stuff that became embedded in everybody's minds, were brilliantly brought out by that movie. You know, it was just great. But I don't believe all that could have happened without this. In the picture of The Godfather, there is, in one scene of a congressional hearing, a picture of the Corleone family that looks exactly like that that was in the McClellan Committee. I find it ironic when I think about it, when I, when I was uh, writing the Valachi papers, 26 publishers in New York uh, turned the book down. They all told me the mafia didn't sell. Joe Valachi was a middling mobster at best, but in the end, his efforts to save himself changed the course of criminal justice. It wasn't what he gave the, the, the government, it's what the government gave him to regurgitate to the American public. And that's the legacy, because nothing was ever the same again for the Italian mob. And it was the largest single intelligence breakthrough in organized crime. And it was not only an intelligence breakthrough, it was a public understanding breakthrough. Once you got the exposure of, uh, of how the organism worked, how the institution ex it started and how it existed. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel and check out more of our content. Feel free to give your feedback and suggestions on what we should do next in the comments. This is Infinite Lee Productions. We love you.